Hey there, and welcome to What's the Story. We're an inquisitive bunch of hosts from the What's the Story team on a mission to uncover stories about faith and courage from everyday people. In doing that, we get the privilege of chatting with amazing guests and have the opportunity to delve into their faith journey, the hurdles they've overcome, and the life lessons they have learned along the way. If you enjoy our podcast, don't forget to subscribe and sign up for our weekly newsletter at our website, whatsthestorypodcast.com. It's your direct line to the latest episodes and detailed show notes delivered straight into your inbox. And the best part, it's totally free. What's the Story is brought to you by Crowd Church, who fully understand that stepping into a traditional church might not be everyone's cup of joe. Crowd Church provides a digital sanctuary, a safe space to explore the Christian faith where you can engage in meaningful conversations rather than just simply spectating. So whether you're new to the Christian faith or in search of a new church family, visit crowd.church. And if you have any questions at all, just drop them an email, hello at crowd.church. They would love to connect with you. And now let's meet your host and our special guest for today. Hi there and welcome to this week's What's the Story podcast. Today I'm joined by a guest, Catherine Gantlett. Now Catherine is a writer and a CME facilitator. She studied, at the, she studied theology at Westminster Theological Centre and now lives in rural Oxfordshire with her son and her husband. She has a background in biomedical science and a PhD from Oxford University in HIV research. And she has a book called Walking Through Winter in which she shares her personal story involving loss of five, ba- five babies through miscarriage and also her daughter Libby who died in labour at full term. She's also currently training to be a spiritual director and probably lots more besides. So I'll introduce her at this point. Uh, Catherine, welcome to our podcast. It's so lovely to have you on here today. Hi, Anna. It's a real privilege to be with you all. Brilliant. Um, So I suppose uh, just obviously I've met you before. We've come across each other a few times in the Christian world now, um, particularly in the infertility and sort of loss kind of community. Um, But for those that are listening in and maybe haven't uh, met you before, don't know who you are, can you tell us just a little bit more about yourself, about work, home life? How does life look for you right now? Yeah. So as you said, I live in rural Oxfordshire. So my husband's a organic dairy farmer. So we uh, we live out in the countryside. Charlie, our son, is eight. And when I'm not sort of busy at home with with all of that, my work basically revolves around my passion for personal and spiritual formation. So, you know, both for me and for anyone that I work with. So that can look like um, spiritual direction. Mm-hmm. It can also, in the um, work setting, see me and helping people understand themselves better and therefore other people. Uh, but essentially, my time is consumed with the question of what does it look like to live a fully human life um, in every season of life. It's a big but important question, isn't it? That um, I'm sure we'll unpackage it more as we go. And you also, I mean, you have that whole sort of science background and, and you did some interesting stuff in COVID as well, didn't you, around the vaccine? Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Well, um, so I did. So I used to work for the uh, Oxford Vaccine Group mm-hmm. who created the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID vaccine. So I wasn't actually working with them during COVID. Um, I left the group about a decade ago, but mm-hmm. a lot of my good friends still work in the group. And uh, so it was really, um, I was so proud of them all. And to mm-hmm. see, so Andrew Pollard was my boss. So to see him knighted was um, was a really um, proud thing for me, actually. To go. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing, so, an amazing team, aren't they? It's really yeah. amazing team. Yeah. yeah. And amazing to kind of have that history and be like a small part of it in some way. Because yeah. yeah. it all, you know, years of research have all built into that, haven't they? So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, let's dig into a little bit more into your story. So I guess we should start at the beginning um, of your faith journey. So can you tell us a bit about the start, like your early years? How did your sort of faith journey begin? Like, did you grow up in a Christian home? How, you know, what were those formative moments? Yeah, so I, I grew up in a Christian home. My parents, so I was born in Kenya, mm-hmm. So, but we moved to this country when I was four. But my parents have both been through boarding school in this country. So I think, you know, we're well schooled in the Christian mm-hmm. faith. But I remember both of them coming to a more living faith. Um, 
I'm the oldest of three. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we, I grew up going to church, um, for most of my sort of childhood, a Baptist church, but faith became a real thing for me. Or uh, my first sort of encounter with Jesus was a, um, a holiday camp, so a scripture union holiday camp. Oh yeah. And, um, just in worship, just having a really visceral sense of the, the spirit and what Jesus had done for me. So I, I guess I was 15, 16 at that mm-hmm. point. And so I grew up going to youth groups, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I guess it really, the decision, you know, the rubber hit the road when I went to university. It's mm-hmm. kind of like, okay, what am I going to do? My parents aren't saying we're going to Sunday, we're going to church on Sunday morning. And I actually had sort of three or four years of um, drifting in and out of church and actually some really disastrous relationships in that time. (laughs) Uh, But, you know, God is so gracious and he always places the right people Mm. alongside us at the right time. And... Uh, so I studied in Cambridge and then moved to London. And when I moved to London, I did go to a home group. And as part of that home group, I met the most wonderful lady who is still one of my good friends now, who had walked a similar journey, was now married and was able to help me um, sort of actually commit for six months, no relationships, no boyfriends. Let's just kind of <laughs> clean the slate. Mm-hmm. And that was a really profound time for me. Um, I started going back to church, but I'd find myself just in tears every Sunday. Um, and in that time, I'd started my PhD at Imperial. And then my supervisor, who actually lived in Oxford, got a job in Oxford. So he moved the lab to Oxford. And I had helped, because of my formative experience in Scripture Union camps, uh, as a young adult, I'd gone back as a leader Mm-hmm. And one of my friends lived in Oxford, so Oxford. So I was like, great. She was able to introduce me to church. And within six weeks of moving to Oxford, um, she was like, well, the church I'm at is having a summer ball. Why don't you come along? It'd be a great way to meet people. Mm-hmm. And that summer ball was six months to the day that I'd committed time to God. And that, long story short, was the evening that I met my husband, John. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, wow. so yeah, God um all through it and I will I'm sure unpack this as we get into um our story of baby loss but you know God is present in all of it and so good Mm. yeah I love that I think it's um it's really encouraging and I'm sure it's probably encouraging to any parents who perhaps have kids in that stage of growing up in church and finding their own feet in their face I mean yeah it's reassuring to know that God doesn't lose us in the middle of that, but there's, you know, he's there, he's right there and he's, he's working all the time. And yeah, I I mean, I have a similar story in that I grew up in the church and I know God was there at every sort of formative stage. And even in those searching moments, it's, Mm. it's really reassuring, isn't it? And I think it's reassuring for us as parents now to know that as well. Like God has his hands right on you. Yeah. Um, And I've had, you know, really powerful moments with our son, Charlie, of just kind of going, "Okay, Lord, I I release him to you. Um, Because, you know, the the talk about the lioness in me as a mother is like, you know, but reflecting back on my own story and seeing God um, there and present when I wouldn't have been, you know, I, I think we often talk about pursuing God and you know running after Jesus and all the rest mm. of it the, the truth is that he is always there mm. and it, it's not God who wanders it's us yeah that's really profound so true mm. yeah so I mean that's kind of your early years and um kind of how you met your husband and stuff and then you know life twists and turns as it does and then at some point baby loss and, and pregnancy loss becomes a part of your story. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because we always unpack a, a kind of key challenge on the on this podcast uh, that someone faces in their faith or, you know, in their life. Um, 
because we don't want to give that picture that you find God and everything's perfect. We know that's not true. Um, but yeah, can you can you tell us a bit more about that story? What happened? How did it begin? How did it unfold? Yeah. So John and I got married in 2006. 2006 yeah. And we had a few years where we just like, no, we're just going to enjoy being married. Mm-hmm. Um, and then 2009, we decided with a very healthy dose of naivety <laughs> that we were ready to start a family. So we got on what turned out to be, you know, the monthly roller coaster. Mm-hmm. And after a year, I con- we conceived. Um but very sadly, that first pregnancy ended in a mis- mis- missed miscarriage mm-hmm. at 11 weeks. Um, and I took that, you know, we both took that really hard. And mm-hmm. like a lot of people who go through some form of infertility, um, you know, we were surrounded by people having babies, family members, church. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, it seemingly was everywhere. Yeah. But... We were like, right, well, the statistics are one in four, one in five pregnancies ends in miscarriage. We'll go again. But after a year, we still hadn't conceived again. So we went through all the fertility workup and they discovered that there was a, an issue with me. Uh, but the doctors were very reassuring, said, no, doesn't mean you can't conceive or carry a baby to term. So we kept going mm-hmm. and um, conceived our daughter Libby in 2011 and um, I carried her to full term uh, but very sadly on the 3rd of July 2012 um, Libby was stillborn Mm -hmm. so that was I describe it like a bomb going off in our lives yeah it just kind of shattered everything Um, and initially I was like I can't do this again I just can't. Um, But, you know, faith is a gift, isn't it? And God gives us faith for different things. And that's the only way I can explain my determination that we kept going. I was like, no, we're not done. And so we kept going. Mm. And I had um, had another three miscarriages after Libby. Gosh. uh, And two failed cycles of IVF. And we eventually conceived our son, Charlie, which is a whole other faith story. Um, And he was born healthy and well in May 2015. So he's eight now? Eight, yeah. yeah. Same same Um, age as my son. So that's how I got to that conclusion so fast. Yeah. 2015. What what a miracle that, like, after all that heartbreak and loss and... Yeah. difficulty conceiving that then yeah you managed to have Charlie so it was it, he is and I say to people I don't use that word lightly mm. he is he is a miracle baby mm. and um you know but once he was born I was like that's it I'm done mm-hmm. um and I could no more grow another baby than I could grow another limb mm. <laughs> so, so, um but yeah it was you know, but but even his conception, I mean, obviously all the loss raises lots of spiritual questions, yeah. but his conception does too. It's like, well, why now? Why us? You know, it's a lot of it is mystery, isn't it? Yeah. So much of faith is, isn't it? Um, mm. In the end. Yeah. But I mean, how, because obviously, you know, you summarized your story beautifully there and so much like heartbreak and loss kind of wrapped up in it though, prior to having Charlie and I mean, how does someone overcome that amount of pain? How does someone survive that amount of loss? Like, how did you get through it? What were the things that helped? So I think I'd always say that you don't overcome it, Mm. but you learn to live with it. Yeah. So people talk about when you lose someone close in a traumatic way, it's like losing a limb. So, um it's like walking for me walking around without my arm Mm -hmm. but it's just not visible to other people so there are times where I've learned you know to live without that limb and Mm -hmm. and life is good and then there are other times where I'm really aware 
that I'm missing that, you know, I'm missing Libby and the other children. Mm. Um, and also now for Charlie, walking him through that, you know, is, yeah. is complex. But I think for me, so I wrote a, my book, Walking Through Winter, yeah. um, and I use the metaphor of winter because the, the temptation is to hunker down and hibernate I mean, mm. just go right. That's it. I'm going to, I'm going to put my head down and hope for spring, and, or try and force spring myself. Yeah. And what I learnt was that rather than enduring winter, um, you have to get out into it. So Parker Palmer is a Quaker writer who I love, mm -hmm. and he talks. Of, he lives in the Upper Midwest where the winters are extreme. Yeah. And he talks about how the winters will drive you crazy until you learn to get out into them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key message that I learned through our, so our winter season lasted seven years. And if, if you don't face the fears and all the emotion and spiritual confusion, um, it, it, it tends to drive your life, but in an unhealthy way. Mm. So, yeah, I learned to embrace it, to get out into it mm -hmm. with God. Um, and the other key I learned is not to do it on my own. Mm -hmm. So obviously that first and foremost is with God. So we can talk about that in terms of how you process that with mm -hmm. God. Um, but also the importance of community. Yeah. So, you know, we're not meant to do life on our own. And um, one of my things that I talk about quite a lot is what it means to be made in the image of God. And we're in danger, I think, sometimes in the church of taking the radical individualistic culture we live in mm. that the, says you can define identity purely based on your own reference points. Um, but we are made in the image of a relational God. Mm. And uh, God is community. Therefore, when we... Im, um, image him best it's in community um, mm. so for me I was very again you know God had gone before I was studying theology as we walked through everything so I had a really safe community to go and ask all the big questions yeah. that loss like that brings and that was so key mm. to um because I, I know lots of people who go through loss uh it won't be necessarily what we went through mm -hmm. and that I was really passionate when I wrote my book that anyone walking through loss could read it it's yeah. just that our story was baby loss um but I, I meet so many people who have left church or walked away from God because of the loneliness and isolation mm -hmm. yeah that's that's um that's so true and I think you're right although not everyone has necessarily experienced pregnancy loss or baby loss everyone does experience loss sooner or later as part of life in in this fallen yeah. world isn't it we all we will all grieve and so I think you know I've read your book Walking Through Winter and it is really beautiful and I think what's really helpful about it is it is written in that way it's written yes it's about your specific journey but it's also about how you weather grief and mm. the storms that come in life which we all experience and and I think those those two keys that you mentioned there around not doing it on your own because grief can be so isolating and also that whole area of learning to be honest and real with God and you touched on lament there didn't you I, I mean I wonder if you can just for anyone who's listening and maybe doesn't quite know what that involves or how that looks in practice, I just wonder if you can unpack that part a little bit more. Like, what is lament? How do you do it? Where do you begin? So lament, one of my favourite quotes from a theologian is, lament is worship in a minor key. I so, love that. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Um, but the key is that it's, it's still communicating with God. Mm-hmm but it's being honest. So I think we too easily label emotions good or bad. So fear and anger and disappointment, they're bad emotions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, joy and 
um, contentment and peace. Those are good emotions. Mm -hmm. And and I think we can be in danger of spiritualizing that, you know, if we're feeling anger or resentment or pain or whatever it is, um, we we need to try and reframe that Mm -hmm. to find joy. Um, But uh, Lament says that before you can turn towards praise and joy, you need to have got out those feelings that are neither good nor bad. Um, Mm. And, but you do it before God. So if you look at the Bible, the Psalms, for example, different people have different estimates of how many of the Psalms are lament, Mm. but a conservative estimate is 50%. Um, Some would say three quarters um, Mm. have elements of lament in them. Um, and what you see is a pattern of the the psalmist complaining, so being really honest about mm. what the problem is. Um, you know, David in some of his psalms says, basically, I'm going to die if you don't sort this out. Yeah. Um, an appeal to God and his character. So I think we can make the mistake of thinking that lament isn't um, faithful because... Um, we're complaining about a situation and Mm. we're, you know, expressing how hard it is. But when you look at the Bible, the most faithful people lamented. Mm. So you've got David, who's called a man after God's heart. You've got um, Jeremiah, who wrote Lamentations. You've got Job, obviously, most famously. Mm. Um, But actually, Jesus laments from the cross. He quotes a lament psalm from the cross. So... um, Actually, it's one of the most faithful things we can do in the face of disorientation to go, do you know, God, I know who you are. I know that you're good. I know that you're loving. But my life, there's such dissonance between that and my lived experience. So where are you? Mm. So appealing to his character. Um, And then sort of... um, stimulating him to action so saying you know because of your character I I need you to work on my behalf Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously in the old testament and and for us now that comes from covenant relationship so it's like marriage so if you think about marriages a marriage that's in danger is one where the couple have stopped communicating Mm -hmm. as long as they're still communicating Um, they're in relationship and the covenant allows each partner to hold the other to account Mm -hmm. and it's the same in our covenant relationship with God Um, because he has promised um, to be in relationship with us it means that we can call on him and say come on Um, and also like one of our prayers when we were going through it all was you know we've got all these people watching us who are not Christians that wouldn't say they had a faith and they're looking at us going well these guys are the Christian people Mm -hmm. (laughs) and they're going through all of this so it's like well come on God we need you to act to show who you are to other people Mm -hmm. so stimulate but then all of the all of the lament psalms with the exception of maybe one or two end with an expression of trust of trust in Mm -hmm. God you know that um uh if you think about lamentations, you know, the famous verse that we pull out about God's mercies are new every morning. Um, so, so you've got a, com- a complaint, an appeal to God's character, a stimulation to action, and then an expression of trust. Um, so you can use the Psalms to mm-hmm. pray with, but when I run retreats and workshops on lament, I encourage people to write their own laments using that um cast mnemonic that's such a helpful way of remembering it cast just those four sections it's like a really practical thing you can do and and like you say you can do it verbally you can write it down it's just I think that's you know something that everyone should have a go at doing um Mm. it's just it's a really practical tool I think and yeah you're so right it's it's like it's like almost a 
kind of long forgotten sort of side of faith, isn't it? It's mm. so there in the Bible. And yet yeah. we don't often do that very well in our kind of modern evangelical charismatic kind of Western churches. No. We've kind of lost some of that art because we sometimes lean quite heavily into the sort of positive side of praise and worship, don't we? Mm. And we sort of forget that's there as well. But of course it's there in life. So it does leave this kind of gap reality yeah. gaps sometimes for people who are grieving and are struggling um so I think that that is so useful it's and and it's it's not just for for people who are struggling or going through loss mm. lament is a really powerful way of standing in solidarity with those who are going through loss yeah. but also um in global situations so when I've run workshops, I've had people write really powerful laments about world situations. Mm. So it's it's an art that we need we need to regain, um, particularly in the charismatic evangelical church, mm. um, and a community. You know, um, yes, you can do it on your own, but there's something really powerful again. You know, about community mm. and doing it in community. So. I would love to see more wor- worship um, led from lament. And actually there, there is some more worship music now mm. that, that helps with that. So if people are interested, the Porter's Gate um, have a whole album called Lament Songs and their latest one, Sanctuary Songs, is, um, is about helping people face the reality of life with faith. Fab. That's that's really good, and and all of these uh, references that we're we're discussing and and the books and stuff we'll, uh, throughout the discussion. Just to say, we'll add them to the show notes at the end, so people can find those links and stuff. If if you are interested in digging deeper on anything we talk about in this session, actually. Um, now I know we could go on and on, and we could t- talk on and on about lament because it's such a fascinating area. But I suppose just bring it back to your story a little bit. Um, how do you feel that that whole sort of journey you went through over six or seven years of uh, loss has like shaped or changed your faith? I mean, you touched on some of that there. You talked about, you know, the things you learn and you write about in your book. But how do you sort of feel it shaped you personally and your walk with God, your faith journey? I know it's not a story you would have chosen, but, you know, uh, yeah. How, how has it sort of shaped your life? Um. So I remember saying to John, my husband, mm-hmm. not long after Libby died, that I don't mind if people say John and Catherine were never the same after this, but it ultimately has to have a positive. But, mm. um, partly because as Libby's mum, I don't want her associated just with sadness. Mm. And um, I was reminded today out on a walk of the, t- the term bright sorrow, so what that means is that you, joy coming from really hard, really sad times. Mm. And so everything we went through has had a totally transformative effect on who I am, who John is. Mm. Um, but I think because we chose to do it with God, mm. um, that transformation has been life-giving and I don't say that lightly like Mm. in a heartbeat I would trade what we went through to have our daughter and other children with us but I know that I'm a more compassionate person Um, I have the privilege now of walking alongside others who are walking through really hard times and bearing witness to their stories And it has shaped what I do work-wise. So one of, there are lots of big questions that come out of Mm. uh, seasons of loss. Um, Obviously, you know, it does God exist first off. Mm. And if he does, what's he like? But then sort of very related to that, who am I? Um, And so everything I do work-wise now is about helping people go deeper into um, who are they? Mm-hmm. Um, and actually the 
the intertwined question of who is God. Um, so, so yeah, it's shaped me as a person mm -hmm. in really profound ways. Um, it continues to be hard. And, and there are times where I feel like I'm back in the raw grief again. Mm -hmm. um, but from a faith point of view, it's grown a passion for emotional agility, so the, um, emotional health, mm -hmm. so what we talked about with lament, um, and, and also um, a greater comfort with mystery, you know, that I, I'm an academic at heart, I love mm -hmm. questions, I love digging, I'm curious, but actually, you know, when we're suffering, we often go to the Bible for answers. So we go to Job and we go, right, you know, explain why I'm suffering. But actually, Job doesn't do that. The Bible doesn't do that. Um, what the Bible does, I mean, it's wisdom literature. So it shows us how in those seasons to live well. Mm. Um, so, you know, I still have an awful lot of questions. Uh, but I have experienced God in the middle of it. And I think that's the one thing that I would want people to take away is if you try and look for spring or you hunker down, mm. you miss meeting God in the middle of or the messy middle, the pain. Um, and some of my most profound encounters with God have been in the times of greatest pain. Yeah, that's that's really interesting to hear. It's so profound um, because everything in our natural human instinct says run away from pain, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And yet you're yeah. saying like God's right there. And mm -hmm. of course that figures because the Bible talks about like he's the God of all comfort. So of course he's there in the pain and there's those mm -hmm. encounter moments. And But yeah, it's it, it's not something that comes natural and and. Mm -hmm. It's something that, as you say, you wouldn't choose as your story, but you've so clearly learned that in your life. And it's really inspiring to hear about. And, you know, it, it, it's clear that you've formed a deeper faith and, you know, kind of almost reshaped your life around this experience. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's really inspiring that something devastating doesn't have to devastate your entire life. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's probably really encouraging for anyone who's going through something right now that's similar or maybe quite mm -hmm. different, but, you know, that the devastating thing doesn't have to cause just devastation. And, mm -hmm. and that's that's so, um, I don't know, I find that really inspiring wherever I see a story like that. And yours is definitely one of them. And, I mean, that's why that's why I loved reading your book as well. And, and like, I wonder, could you, could you tell us, like, Tell us a little bit more about it. I know you touched on it, but kind of where do people get it? How can they get a copy? What can they expect in it? So in terms of what you can expect, I, I read a lot. And so I read a lot of books after we lost Libby. Mm. And I was like, I'm going to write the book that I don't think is there. Mm -hmm. So it's a mix of personal reflection, uh, deeper theological unpacking of some of the big questions about God, our identity and meaning and purpose, and then um, practical application. Okay, so I find myself in winter. How do I embrace the season? Mm. So Jesus, when he talks about, you know, taking up your cross, um, I love how Eugene Peterson translates it in the message. He has Jesus saying, don't run from suffering, embrace it. So mm. it's what we were talking about. So I use the Danish practice of hygge, mm -hmm. which, so the Danes have some of the longest winters, but they are often rank really high in global happiness scales. And part of the reason is around hygge. So I unpack some practical habits, like um, community, for example, um, gratitude, which sounds really hard when you're in the middle of something mm. really tough. Um, and, and also the importance of refuge um, in the middle of winter. So I'm all for getting out there 
in the elements, you know, mm. the lament side of things, but we do also need home somewhere to come back to. So, so yeah, it's a mix of personal story, theological reflection mm-hmm. and practical application for anyone going through any form of loss. Yeah. Uh, and you can get it in, in anywhere that you would get your books. So Eden, Waterstones, Amazon, my website, which we can link to. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. And there, there's paper and a Kindle version. Brilliant. So definitely a resource well worth checking out. I, I highly recommend it myself. So yeah, really useful on that subject. Um, so tell us Catherine then, like in sort of reflection on some of what we've been talking about today and, and your, your journey thus far, kind of what's kind of one key lesson or learning point that you've I know it's really hard to ask anyone to distill it down to one thing because I'm sure there's so many but if you could sort of sum it up in one phrase or sentence or perhaps one idea what is that key thing that you feel like God's taught you or that you've learned through through your journey so I had to think about this quite hard (laughs) yeah but going back to image of God and how we image God um I think the key thing I've learned is that God is a God of vulnerability and, you know, the incarnation is God at his most vulnerable, you know, coming as we've just, we've just celebrated Christmas, you know, so God became a baby and, you know, was fully reliant on his parents. Um, And we want, we want a God who's in control, a God who's powerful, victorious, all of that. Um, and obviously, you know, in the risen Jesus, we, we have the promise of that. And that's where our hope is anchored. Mm. But for a lot of people, um, we live most of our lives in the mid, in the middle of that, in the mess. Yeah. And, and so knowing that God is a God of vulnerability, um, who walks alongside us, what I've learned is the power of being vulnerable myself and the most vulnerable thing I can do is open up my story to others and say well this is this is me this is how God has worked Mm. in my story and the power of that is that you know it takes courage to do that but you then there's an invitation for others Mm. to open their home essentially of their lives Mm. and and share um, in an authentic, vulnerable way, um, their lived experience. Um, so I think, I think the vulnerability mm. of God is something that had, I've learned powerfully. Yeah, that's such an interesting way of looking at it, and yeah, quite quite humbling, really, isn't it? That God made Himself vulnerable, and therefore. Mm kind of sets the mold almost for us to do the same or to be able to do the same um but you know we're so you know we're so grateful that you have made yourself vulnerable and been open to sharing your story and glad that you've done it today for us on the podcast as well like you know and I'm personally grateful because we have similarities in our stories um but I mean tell us kind of before you go like just tell us a little bit more about what you're up to right now what you're working on what are your hopes for 2024 have you got anything else in the pipeline what's coming up um so as you mentioned at the beginning I'm training as a spiritual director mm-hmm. or company so um I'm leading retreats based mm-hmm. out of walking through winter I'd love to do more of that and I was a contributor to a, a book called Praying Through Infertility, which is a 90-day devotional book, 36 different contributors, so a range of voices, because obviously infertility looks different. Mm. So that is published, um, well, on the 15th of February in this country. So if people want to pre-order that, (laughs) um, they can go wherever they get books for that. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I just continuing to accompany people through what I write, workshops and retreats sounds brilliant loads loads coming up then and is the book 
has it been is has it been pulled together by Sheridan Voisey? Sheridan Voisey. Yeah, yeah, he's a great author yeah, yeah. on this subject as well. If anyone's interested in anything more around childlessness and and infertility, but yeah, we'll again we'll share the that in the show notes because it's a great resource that's about to be launched. Um. Finally, just tell us, you know, people have enjoyed listening to you today, have enjoyed hearing a bit about what you do, about what you teach about, you know, how do people connect with you? How do they kind of find out more, you know, your website, social handles? Tell us where we can find you. So my website is katherinegauntlet.org and I'm on Twitter as kgauntlet and Facebook as katherinegauntlet.org. So the advantage of having an unusual name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't need to be like 2004 or anything like that. No. Yeah. yeah. If you find Catherine Gantlett, you've... It's probably you. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, we'll again, we'll add those all to the show notes so that people can find you easily. And um, yeah, please do connect with Catherine if you're interested in this subject, if you want to connect with her more, if you want to learn more about her retreats or her book or anything else that she's doing on this subject, because it really is brilliant. Well, that's probably all we've got time for today. We're um, where the t- clock is ticking on. But Catherine, thank you so much for joining us today on What's the Story? It's been so generous of you to share a bit of your story with us today. Uh, so thank you for being here. Oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Anna. And um, thank you also for being here, listeners. Uh, we wouldn't be anything without you. So we will catch you very soon on What's the Story? And just like that, we've reached the end of another fascinating conversation. Remember to check out Crowd Online Church at www.crowd.church. Don't forget to subscribe to What's the Story on your favorite podcast app. We've got a treasure trove of inspiring stories coming your way, and we'd hate for you to miss any of them. What's the Story is a production of Crowd Online Church. Our fantastic team, including Anna Kettle, Matt Edmondson, Tanya Hutzelak, and myself, Sada Fainan, work behind the scenes to bring these stories to life. Our theme song is the creative work of Josh Edmondson. If you're interested in the transcript or show notes, head over to our website, whatsthestorypodcast.com. And while you're there, sign up for our free newsletter to get all the goodness delivered straight to your inbox. That's all from us this week. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll catch you in the next episode. Bye for now.